benefits and payroll. So I've been in those hot seats and all three of those pieces kind of culminate together into this ACA project that's year long and then your reporting that occurs at the end of the year. So this webinar is focused on just those reporting pieces. Um, if you're just joining, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, um, you will be muted throughout the presentation and then there will be a question and answer period at the end through the chat box. So there is a chat box in the control panel for the GoToMeeting. If you have any questions, just go ahead and send those through. You can send them directly to me, Lisa Sluk, and it's in the little drop down box there, um, or you can send it to everyone, it's up to you, and I'll address those at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And today we're going to cover the 1094-1095C forms. We're going to talk about what's new on those forms, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the affordability um, and things that could affect line 15 for this reporting year, discuss who needs a form, the filing dates, extensions that are available, penalties if you don't file on time, and we'll go through some examples. And then during the question and answer period, if you have any examples that you want to go over, we can definitely do that as well. So if you just have some specific hire dates, rehire dates, term dates, and or things that happened with an employee if they went part-time to full-time, we can go over those as well. So first we're going to talk about the 1094C form. This is the transmittal form that goes to the IRS and it talks about you as the employer, how many employees you have, um, were you part of an aggregated group, which is a common ownership, um, how many forms you're submitting to the IRS, and so on. So we're going to go through this step by step. Some of this is going to be basic and review, like the first part here is your employer information. Just do please make sure that the name of the employer that you're putting on here matches the documents at the IRS. So I have an example of little ant. Little Ant in the rubber tree, rubber tree Plant, High Hopes. Um, <laughs> that's the name of another company that I have. And so if I was submitting this, it would be Little Ant LLC instead of Little Ant because that LLC is very important to the IRS, especially if you are filing electronically through an HRIS system that you may have. Those pieces need to match up or the file will be rejected. And so you want, might not know exactly why it's being rejected, but that could be very, one of the main pieces there is that the name just doesn't match up with the IRS documents. Line um, 18 here is the total number of forms that you're submitting to the IRS. And then line 19, go ahead and check the box that this is an authoritative transmittal. If you happen to be part of a controlled group um, under Internal Revenue Code, code 414. So if you have common ownership in any other entity, or if there's five or fewer owners and those owners also have ownership in another entity, you could all be together as part of what's called a controlled group or aggregated ALE, applicable large employer. So if you are part of those groups, please call me and I'll go over the details of what exactly you need to do on the form that's different. Um, or if you're sending batches of 1095Cs to the IRS in separate groups, then there might be something that needs to change too. But to make this a little more um, streamlined, I just took out those pieces because it didn't seem like many of you on the call were going to fall under those categories. But you, if you happen to, please give me a call. So line 20 of the 1094C form, this total will match what you entered on line 18. So going back there to line 18, that's the number of forms that you're submitting to the IRS the number of 1095C forms, because just this, if you're filing on paper, you got to send this 1094C form along with all of the copies of the 1095C form that you're distributing to your employees. And that distribution date is March 2nd to your employees. If you're filing on paper, it's February 28th to the IRS, which is before the employee deadline date. So just keep that in mind. Um, but you want to make sure that those copies go to the IRS. I have had a couple clients that they just sent in the 1094 without the copies. So the IRS is now contacting them and saying, where's the copies? Um, or they sent in the copy of the 1095 that was received from their payroll administrator. And if you are just joining, if you could please mute yourself on your side. And if you're calling from the computer, you may need to mute your speaker there as well. Um, so some, some payroll and HRIS systems produce a copy of a 1095C that's not in landscape form. It's um, more, looks like a W-2, it's kind of all condensed on a one sheet of paper. That copy cannot go to the IRS. 
is very, unless they've met multiple different stipulations in their, um, the IRS's publication as to what they want, where they want it, that is three quarters from the right, half an inch from the top, and they want your blood type too. I'm, I'm kidding on the last part, but it does need to be submitted on the landscape form to the IRS. The IRS has started to notify employers that filed in 20, for 2015 reporting that they needed a different version of the form because all of these forms go into, they're scanned into a computer, it's all big data, and then the, the penalty notices are spit out. Those penalty notices are probably going to start coming out this quarter is what's been expected. Um, I have yet to hear of any, so if there's anyone on the call that's received one, please let me know. I'd love to see what it says, read it, and help you with it. Um, so just know that those copies of the 1095Cs in landscape form need to go to the IRS with a 1094C form. So back to where we were on line 20, this total is going to match what you have on line 18. And line 21, most of you are probably going to check now. If you happen to, again, be part of that controlled group or aggregated ALE, we can talk after and go over the other pieces to this. So line 22, this was a big one for 2015 reporting year, and it's a little more simplified this year because there's not much transition relief left. For this qualifying offer box, box A, you must offer, in order to check this box, you must offer minimum essential coverage, minimum value, so that's that 60% actuarial value or a bronze plan, to employee, spouse, and dependents. And the rate for the employee-only coverage must be at or below 9.66% of the mainland federal poverty level divided by 12. So in the previous webinar, that was the federal poverty line rate of pay safe harbor, and that amount is $95.38. So if you offer a plan to an employee that you pay 100% of, employee only coverage, the employee pays for dependents and spouse, it's minimum essential coverage, minimum value, you can check that box, box A, and use code 1A on line 14 of the 1095C forms, because you, you fall under the, everything that 1A encompasses. If you're eligible to use 1A, then you will leave line 15 blank and line 16 doesn't need a code either. So when we dive into the um, 1095C forms, I'll show you that in a little more detail. There is an alternative method for furnishing 1095Cs to the employees when you're able to use this qualifying offer method. However, when furnishing the information to the IRS, they still want it on the 1095C form. So you might as well just kill two birds with one stone and complete the 1095C. Box C there, Section 4980H transition relief. There is very, very limited transition relief available throughout the 2016 calendar year that was part of your 2015 plan year. So um, please read the instructions. They have expanded the instructions for the 1094-1095C form and the definition of what the transition relief is and the things that you need to certify that happened all the way back in some cases to 2014. So we're talking about almost three years now of benefit information. So just if you want to check that box because it may apply to you, please make sure that you really read the instructions and the definitions for that transition relief. The other box here is a 98% offer method. In order to check that box, you need to certify that for each month, you offered affordable minimum value coverage to at least 98% of all of your ACA full-time eligible employees. In the previous webinar, we went through what an ACA full-time eligible employee is. It's anyone that, when they are hired, are reasonably expected to work 30 hours a week or more, or have that 130 hours of service per month as well. And it's any individual who was in an initial measurement period as a variable or part-time or seasonal employee that hit that 130 hours of service on average during their initial measurement period. They are now a full-time employee as they're part of their stability period and needed to be offered benefits. So if you can certify that you offered it to at least 98% of your employees, then you can check that box. And if you check that box, then you don't need to complete the column that's the total full-time employees per month. You're, you're waived of that requirement. But make sure that you can prove it. Do you have waivers on file for your employees? 
do you have a policies and, and procedure that you go through when you hire someone to make sure that they're notified of their status, that the enrollment period is X date to X date for them, that you've contacted them and made sure that they're going through the process or that they have the paperwork. Um, make Just document everything that's occurred with those employees. Um, you, in order to have a um, an offer for the entire plan year, like during an open enrollment, you need to offer it at least once prior to that open enrollment to that employee, and then that covers that entire plan year. It's those new hires that you also need to make sure that you're capturing, and you can certify that you offered it to them. And audit yourself. Make sure you haven't missed anyone. So getting into part three of the 1094C form, this column A here, this is the minimum essential coverage. So you're indicating to the IRS that yes, I offered a minimum essential coverage plan for either all 12 months or specific months. So maybe you weren't in existence in the first of the year or um, you didn't have a plan until July of last year, for example. Then you would check the box for yes from July to December and the box for no from January to June. If you happen to cover for all 12 months, even if you have a different plan year than a 1-1 one, one start date, then you can check on line 23 the all 12 months and yes. Then in column B here, if you're not one of those that can certify the 98%, you do need to enter in the number of ACA full-time employees for each month out of the year. You don't include employees that are in a waiting period or an administrative period. So if someone is first hired in January, January 12th, they're in, let's say, a first of the month following 30-day waiting period. So their offer of coverage starts March 1st. Even though they're technically a full-time employee with you, you're offering them benefits, they do not get counted in column B until March because they're in what's called a limited non-assessment or waiting period. So you don't count them there, but you would count them as part of your total employee count, which is column C, for those months in which they were employed by you. And there's certain dates that you can choose to look at. Most systems, and just for ease of use, people choose the first of the month. So in the example of that employee that started on the 12th, they would not be included in column B because they're in that waiting period or limited non-assessment period. They would not be included in column C because they were not employed by you on the first of the month because they started January 12th. They would be included in February because they are now they are now employed by you on the first of February. If that employee then leaves employment on February 28th, or I guess last year it was 29th, then they would still be counted as part of February because they were employed by you on the first of the month, but then they fall off for your total count in January. Most systems do this for you. I still suggest you take a look at it and audit it. I did this manually for many clients that um, were under the software that I was working for last year. So make sure that it's flowing properly for your organization because the IRS will look at this and will apply penalties based on the numbers that you put in here. So you even have more of a fight if these numbers are not correct if you have a penalty coming your way. So in column D here, that's part of the aggregated group. So if that falls under you, then you would need to, to check when you were part of that common ownership. And column E here is if you are part of that transition relief and you checked the box in the other portion for the 4988 transition relief indicator, there are different codes you now need to put in this column to indicate which um, transition relief you fall under, and there is, is the codes are in the instructions, so please refer to that. Part four, um, if you are part of a controlled group, you do need to complete this portion here. And then we're ready for the 1095Cs. So this is a thorn in the side for a lot of people, um, and we're gonna break this one down as well. So for part one here is the employee information. Please use the most recent address you have for those employees. Um, the employee does not attach this form to their, to their tax return. They do need to keep it with their taxes, 
but they don't actually return it back to the IRS. And the IRS has updated the form to state that up at the top. The employer information section here, uh, you use the same employer information that was used on the 1094C form. And again, make sure that that name matches what the IRS has on file. Then part two, everyone's favorite part. The plan month start right here is still optional for 2016. So you don't have to worry about it if your payroll or HRA system hasn't caught up with that yet. You don't need to enter it. If you want to enter it, it's not when the employee st starts their coverage. It's your plan year for everybody. Even if the employee wasn't there when the plan year started, um, it's the, you use the plan year for every single employee. So if that's 1-1, 7-1, 12-1, whatever it might be, you can use 0-1, 0-7, or 12 as that plan start month. So line 14 really goes through what happened to the employee throughout the year. Were they, did they have an offer of coverage or not? And if they did have an offer of coverage, what code was associated with that offer. And those codes are all outlined in the instructions. The most common ones you're going to see are 1H, which is no offer of coverage, 1A, which we touched on earlier, that's a plan that's offered that's minimum value, minimum essential coverage, that's affordable at the mainland federal poverty level, safe harbor, and it's also offered to dependent children. So you can use that code 1A. 1E is the same plan, Minimum essential coverage, minimum value offered to employees, spouses, and dependents. But the rate at which the employee's share is calculated is higher than 9.66% of the mainland federal poverty level. So it might be $100 a month or $115. So then you can't use the 1A code. You have to use 1E. So that's the major difference between those codes there. So you take a look at was the individual employed by you all 12 months? Was the offer made all 12 months? Take a look at any audit files you have. What type of business practices are you using when you offer a plan to an employee? So if they're a new hire, does it state that they were offered the plan from March to December, which is the end of your plan year? Or during open enrollment, does it state it's for the next plan year that's January to December? All those things are just good best practices to have in your information. When did the coverage start? That's when the code should change for a new hire not when the employee is given the paperwork to fill out um, to enroll in benefits or if it's their administrative period as, an, as a variable hour employee and they hit that 130 hour threshold. It's not the date that you give them that paperwork. It's the date that their coverage actually is starting. So if they have a 3-1 start date for your coverage, that's when you're gonna see line 14 change is effective March 1st. Did you offer coverage to the employee for every day in the month? Partial employee or partial months don't count. So if you have a 31st day waiting period, so everyone's enrolled on the 31st day, then your code won't change until the offer of coverage spans the entire month. So if someone's hired January 12th, their 31st day is uh, probably around the 11th. Um, or 13th, it just kind of depends. So uh, it wouldn't start until March 1st, that, that offer of coverage, because you don't get credit for a partial month. And the same holds true for like a 90-day waiting period where everyone's enrolled on the 91st day. And you report the plan that was offered to the employee, not necessarily what the employee elected. And that's true for line 15 as well, for the rate. So if multiple plans are offered, let's say you have a minimum essential plan, minimum essential coverage, but it's not minimum value. And then you have a minimum essential minimum value that's offered to employee, spouse, and dependents. You want to use the one that's going to be the most beneficial to you, which is the minimum essential minimum value to employee, spouse, and dependents. If the employee chooses just the minimum essential plan, that's on them. They were still offered a plan that, was, that met all the requirements for your employer mandate. So what's new for those codes? There's some conditional offer codes that the IRS added this year. So if you offer a plan to employees and dependents that's at least minimum essential coverage and minimum value, but you're offering it to spouses only when they're not covered somewhere else, then you want to use the conditional offer code. So where I've seen this applied is that an employer will pay for coverage for employees, spouses, and dependents at 100%, 
but they'll only pay that 100% for the spouse. If they don't have coverage through their employer, they can't, they're not eligible for Medicare or whatever it might be. The IRS has stated what a conditional offer is to them, and it's subject to one or more reasonable objective conditions. And they've only given one example of what that is. For instance, it's offer to cover an employee spouse only if the spouse is not eligible for coverage under Medicare or group health plan sponsored by another employer. That's the only example that they've given of a reasonable objective condition. So if you have anything else, I would look at it with fresh eyes and with an IRS lens to make sure that it's falling under what they consider as a conditional offer. So let's look at line 15. This is where all the money comes in. So if the, em the employee only rate that needs to go here is the lowest cost plan that you offer. So if you offer three different plans to an employee and the employee only coverage rate is $80, $100, and $150, you're gonna use the lowest cost plan, which is $80. If that plan, since it's under that $95.38 marker for the mainland federal poverty level, if that plan is offered to employees, spouses, and dependents as minimum value, minimum essential coverage, you can use code 1A. When using code 1A, you leave line 15 totally blank. If you need to use another code that's in the um, outline there, so maybe you just only offered it to employees, and so you're using a 1B code, even if you offered it to employees at 100%, you still need to fill out line 15 and put in all zeros. For non-calendar year plans, if the rate changed in the middle of the year, let's say you have a start in July, you're gonna wanna show that that rate changed in July on the form as well. So talking about affordability, um, notice 2015-87, if you Google that, you'll bring up the document that goes through a lot of different question and answers. What came out of that is any employer contribution to an HRA, not an HSA, but an HRA, may decrease the amount shown on line 15 if you want it to. It's in your employee's best interest to have the higher rate shown on line 15. If you are submitted with a penalty notice, you can fight it by saying that I had an HRA contribution and it actually was affordable to the employee with that contribution. That's transition relief that's occurring right now. Um, as long as the plan was in place prior to December 16th, 2015, then you can do this. Medical and dependent FSA contributions may also decrease that amount shown on line 15 as long as it was in place before December 16th, 2015, which is when these regulations came out. These are proposed regulations. It was open for comment. Final regulations were supposed to be delivered prior to January 1st, 2017. With everything happening in Washington, I don't see any final regulations coming our way anytime soon, if at all. So. Right now, you can work under the proposed regulations if you want to um, and decrease that amount shown on line 15. Opt out or cash in lieu credit. So wh what are those? That's if you have a plan and you offer it to the employee and you say, well, you know what, if you waive it, then you're going to receive an additional $300 a month on your paycheck. Those opt out and cash in lieu credits will actually increase line 15 if adopted after December 16, 2015. So if you've had it in place for a long time, you can continue to use it. It's not going to affect line 15. But if you are recently adopting that type of a program, you really need to watch line 15 because it could make that plan unaffordable because the IRS is looking at that opt-out credit as um, losing the ability to, to have that cash if they enroll in the plan. So let's say your plan is $100 a month and you're offering an opt-out credit of $300 a month that $300 a month added to the 100, you now have $400 to show on line 15 instead of 100. So just keep that in mind as you're updating your plan documents, going through things for future years, just look back and make sure that nothing has occurred for this type of affordability in the future. And if I had a crystal ball, I'd be able to tell you all what's happening in the future, <laughs> but I don't. And it's, it's quite um, interesting right now what's happening in Washington and so we keep your ear to the ground because there are plans that are supposed to be to committees by January 27th for the budget reconciliation and that affects your mandates, that affects the penalties, 
and that affects how far back they're going to go to look at penalties. So there's lots of things happening right now in Washington, but I don't suggest in any way that you take your foot off the gas. We got to keep going and keep trucking with what we know as of today. So line 16, this is all about the employee's safe harbors and, and what, the, what happened to that employee throughout the year. So in the top line was what was their offer? Did they have an offer and not what type of offer was it? That was line 14. So line 16 is were they employed by you? Were they in a waiting period? Did they enroll or did they waive? All of those pieces are on line 16. The IRS doesn't really care to know what plan they enrolled in. They just want to know um, were they employed? Were they in a waiting period? And then in certain circumstances, did they enroll or waive? Again, if you're able to use that code 1A, you don't have to fill out anything on line 16. So if you have an employee that's been employed by you all 12 months, they had an offer of coverage all 12 months that met the criteria for 1A, your reporting just got super simple for that employee and you just have to put a 1A right here in this box, 14 under all 12 months, then you're done. That's it for that employee. For everyone else, if they were not employed by you on um, any day of the month, you're going to use a 1H code on line 14 and a 2A on line 16. That indicates that they were not employed on any day of the calendar month. When an employee starts employment with you, that first month is considered part of a limited non-assessment period or waiting period. So you use code 2D as in dog. Then any month that they're in a waiting period, you also use code 2D. When an employee has been offered a coverage or enrolled in that coverage for every day of the month, you can use 2C, code 2C. If when an employee terminates and their coverage extends to the end of the month, you still use code 2C for that month, even though they might not have hit that 130 hours for the month or still be considered a full-time employee. We don't want to see the code 2B as in boy on a termination month unless the coverage stops on the day of termination. And in that case, you would use code 2B. But otherwise, it's going to be code 2C. If they waive coverage, so if you're using that 1E code up here, you, you want to show whether they enrolled or waived. And that's just telling the IRS, look, they, they waived the plan. It was affordable to them. And I met my criteria. Um, and you have those affordability safe harbors, and you choose one for your company or one per group of employees. You can't pick and choose for different employees as to what safe harbor you're going to apply. So if you're using, let's say, the rate of pay safe harbor, then and they waived the coverage, you're going to use code 2H. Federal poverty line, again, only comes into play when you're using one of those other funky codes, because otherwise it doesn't apply to a 1A code. If the plan is not affordable to the employee, if it happens to not be afford affordable to that specific employee, you leave 16 blank. You don't put any code because no code applies. Then again, you want to use that 2C as enrolled or the waive code in that termination month if the offer of coverage extends to the end of the month for your employees. So even if they waived coverage and then they terminate, you still want to continue on with that waiver code for that termination month because if had they enrolled, their coverage would have gone until the end of the month. So the instructions expanded a few things. One was the affordability safe harbor code should not be entered on line 16 for any month where you don't hit that 95% offer mechanism. So for the penalty. So to avoid the penalty, you need to offer um, a qualifying plan to employees, spouses, and to employees and dependents to at least 95% of ACA full-time eligible employees. There's that 98% box on the 1094 form, but to alleviate yourself from the penalties, it's the 95%. So if you happen to miss a few people and crap happens and you're outside of that 5% buffer for a certain month, you cannot enter anything on line 16 for that specific month for any of your employees because you just lost protection for all of those employees. What this is basically saying is that the IRS wants you to do their work for them and indicate that, you are open, that you're open to a penalty for a certain month. That's basically what the IRS is asking you to do. I don't work for the IRS, so I can say that. Um, 
the other piece that's new is the multi-employer interim rule relief. So what this means is if you have, let's say, union employees or um, you have employees on your staff that have a plan through a different sponsor that's not you. You are not the plan sponsor. So you don't know when they're eligible. You don't know if they're enrolled. You don't know if they waived because that's all handled somewhere else. Yet they're still your employees, like union employees. You need to use code 2E as an echo regardless of whether any other Series 2 code applies. So prior, I was talking about the first month of employment for an employee, you would use code 2D. In the case of a union employee or anyone with a multi-employer interim relief applicability, you use code 2E for everything while they're employed by you. When they're still not employed by you, it's a 1H2A for all the other months. So make sure you're using those code 2E and that you're reporting on all of your union employees and that you are including those employees as part of your total employee counts on your 1095 form. Talked a little bit about limited non-assessment period and this again is that code 2D. There are five different periods where you can use this code. So again, it's the first month of employment, any benefit waiting period, an initial measurement period, an initial administrative period. All of those are time frames when you can use the 2D code. If you happen to miss offering an employee a benefit on time, you lose the protection of the 2D code and you can't enter it on the form. So if someone was hired January, I'm gonna pick on the 12th, and they have a first of the month following 60 day waiting period. So that would be an April 1st effective date. If oopsies, people are on vacation, things happen, you know, it's just crazy time, whatever it might be, um, you know, quarter end, and th that person got missed, on your form, you can't use 2D for January, February, or March, or April for that matter. You would change your code when the May happens. All of those months there now go towards that 95% rate that you have to offer coverage. So you have that 5% buffer. Every one that's under that goes against that 5% buffer. So it, your 5% buffer can be eaten up very quickly um, when you're not, when things aren't being tracked properly. So you just wanna make sure that you offer coverage on time every time. I think I mentioned in the webinar earlier today that I'm working with a client right now that we're auditing and they've missed people and they're outside of that 5% buffer and it doesn't look good. So just make sure that you're following your policies and procedures and that you're really capturing everybody when you should be. So part three, you do need to complete this if you as the employer are acting as a plan sponsor. So if you're self-insured, you're self-funded, you're part of a benefit trust or a multi-employer welfare arrangement or a MIWA, you wanna make sure that you're completing this as long as nobody else is. So like if you're fully insured, the carrier does this on the 1095 B is in boy form. So you would probably get one of those here um, by March 2nd. And that's the piece of information that you use to do your taxes with the IRS that says, yes, I've been covered for all of these months. I've had coverage. So you as a plan sponsor need to tell your employees and non-employees that you've been covered for these specific months. So you wanna make sure that this box right up here is checked on this very first line and some software programs may miss this. I've looked at a couple and they're still missing it. So make sure that this box is checked then you enter in the employee if they were covered during the year. If they waived, then you don't need to put anything here. The employee's SSN needs to go here. And then if they were covered all 12 months, you can check that, check that box. Otherwise, you check the box for the month that they were covered. If they were covered for just one day of the month, you still check the box, which is contradictory to line 14, where you don't change your code unless they're covered for the entire month. So if dependents were covered on the plan, dependents and spouses, they also need to be listed and you need to obtain their social security number. If you're unable to obtain their social security number, there's 10 solicitation rules that you have to go through before you can use a date of birth. And then their information needs to be on there too. 
If you have any non-employees on your self-funded plan, like board members or COBRA beneficiaries, so someone was on COBRA for the entire calendar year of 2016, they would still get a form, even though they weren't your employee for the entire calendar year of 2016. They still need to have a form from you because you are the plan sponsor. I talked a little bit about those 10 solicitation rules. And that's in Notice 2015-68. It breaks it down as to exactly what you need to do. You need to make three different attempts. One is considered, uh, when you give them the enrollment form, that's considered opening the account. They kind of look at this as like you're opening a bank account. Is <laughs> kind of what I gathered is that they're using those same type of rules. So they didn't really bother to change much of the verbiage. Um, the second attempt is 75 days after you receive the enrollment form. And then the third attempt is December 31st of the, of the year following their enrollment. You need to contact them in writing, and I would document it and include a return envelope, an envelope for them as well. You can try and contact them electronically through email or through other different ways. You might be able to uh, make an announcement through a human resource information system, but there are rules associated with that, so make sure that you're following those as well. So who really needs a form, 1095C? It's any employee that was at least full-time for one month out of the calendar year, and ACA full-time. So if an employee was hired in November of 2015, and they're, um, or should I, no, November of 2016. Sorry, I'm doing multiple different years for multiple different clients right now. So November of 2016, if they were hired in November 2016, and they were in a waiting period in December, either as a full-time employee or as um, an initial measurement, you don't have to submit a form. But here's the kicker on that. If you happen to miss that person's enrollment and then lose that 2D protection, you now have a corrected form to do in 2016. So I suggest that you submit a form for anyone that may have been in a waiting period at the end of the year, just so your bases are covered. You don't have to. It's just a suggestion. Uh, you do not need to submit a form for anyone who is part-time unless you're self-funded and they enrolled in your plan. Um, if you submit these forms electronically to your employees through your HRS system, so if you have an ACA module that's pulling all these codes in for you and creating those forms, you can definitely submit it electronically to your employees like you might do for a W-2, but you do need to have consent to furnish it to the employees through those types of systems. And there's rules associated with that as well in, their, in the instructions. Um, when you have a system that's creating the forms for you, please do audit those forms and make sure the codes are showing up when they're supposed to that the rate is pulling in at the amount it's supposed to, um, and that all of the information looks correct. Do not blindly blanket, uh, like approve them, um, and the 1094 form as well. So if you have 250 or more 1095C forms, you're required to file what's called through the AIR system. This is different than the W-2 system. Uh, it's a totally separate piece of technology that our tax dollars put together, and that's that big data like wheelhouse that I talked about, because it takes information from everywhere, from the marketplace, from you, from um, your, your plan sponsor. So if that's you or the carrier, all of that information gets put together, uh, and then the penalty notices are automatically spit out through that. It's not somebody sitting down and looking at all of these. So if you have 250 or more, you're required to e-file. You can e-file if you have less. If you are electronically filing, you have until March 31st to do so. If you are filing on paper, the deadline is February 28th, and that's, that's to the IRS. To your employees, the deadline has been moved to March 2nd, so you have until March 2nd to get those out to your employees or postmark them by. If you need an extension to file with the IRS, you can file for a 30-day extension. It's an automatic thing through Form 8809. There are no additional extensions for the employee copies. So what happens if you don't file or you don't file on time? Let's say you're not offering a plan to your employees. It's a $260 per return fee 
for failure to file to the IRS. $260 per return for failure to give your employees a copy or to file on time or provide that copy on time. In additional fees are out there for intentional disregard. There is a cap of $3 million in fees. That's $3 million in fees unless there's intentional disregard and then there's no cap at all. There is good faith reporting that still applies for 2016. However, if the IRS doesn't see many changes in your reporting from year prior and they still see a lot of errors, your good faith is probably not going to be there. And the IRS really hasn't defined necessarily what good faith is. Um, is good faith reporting but still having a lot of missing information? Doubtful. Is good faith reporting where the information is there and you've you know done the best you could? Definitely. And you know, making sure that you have documentation, um, especially if there's an issue with e-filing, that you tried to e-file on X date, um, that you tried again on this other date, that you received this notice back and that you looked at it on this date. Make sure you document all of that. Because I again I don't have that crystal ball, I don't know where all of this is going, but those penalties can be pretty severe. So as far as responsibility goes, it is the employer shared responsibility. So it is your responsibility to make sure that the codes are on the forms properly in the right places and that they're the right codes for your organization. It's not up to the software company. Um, it's not up to the CPA or third party or broker or, or your form generator service. Again, please don't just blanket approve what you have in your system. Make sure you're looking at it. And because it is garbage in, garbage out. If you put a wrong date in your system and the system's going off of that date to calculate when your code should change on your form, your form is now incorrect. Um, read the instructions and know the codes for your organization. So getting into some examples and then I'll get into questions. Um, if the employee had the same offer throughout all 12 months that was at the same rate, and let's say they enrolled all 12 months, this is what your form would look like. You can use that one box right there. This is with a plan year that changed in July, but the employee had the same type of offer, and they enrolled throughout the entire year. But line 15, we can't use the all 12 months box because it changed here in July. The rate changed. So you want to just update that for that line there. This is a first of the month following 60 day waiting period with a plan year change in December. So as you can see here, the employee was hired in July, July 25th. So they're in a 2D right there in July. Then throughout their waiting period and then they enrolled here in October. Then they were offered another plan at the start of the plan year in December and they decided to waive that coverage. It was still affordable to that employee based on their rate of pay. So that's what was set here at 2H. For the rest of the year, they weren't employed. So it's a 1H, no offer of coverage, and 2A, not employed by you. So here, it was an oopsie, and they weren't caught. They weren't um, offered that benefit that started October 1st. But they were caught in open enrollment, so they have that offer of coverage there in December. So this employer lost all the protection of that 2D code from July to November, which is pretty substantial. When If there's any other people that fell under this or um, any other people that got missed at, in an initial administrative period in those months, it could very well kick up that to that 5% buffer really fast. And in this example, the employee was hired back in December and it's the first of the month following 60 day waiting period. So they have a 1H2D here because they were an employee, but they were just in a waiting period for these two months. Then they were offered a plan here to employees and dependents, but not spouses, not at all, not even conditionally. So it's a totally different code, it's 1C. And then the rate was $400. So it's not affordable to that employee. So line 16 would be left blank and they terminated in August, it's still left blank. We don't put a 2B as in boy there because had they enrolled, their coverage would have started or ended at the end of the month in which they terminated. So it flows all the way through. And then they were 1H2A, no offer and not employed for the rest of the year. This employee was terminated 
back in December 2015, but they were in an ongoing stability period and rehired in March, so they were offered effective April 1st. That's again that 13-week rule that we touched on in the um, webinar earlier today. If you're self-insured and the employee was on COBRA during these months here, you would show an enrollment for all 12 months because you are that plan sponsor and they were enrolled all 12 months out of 2016, even though they weren't employed by you for these dates. So that's what it would look like when someone leaves and comes back to your employment and they're in a stability period and it was less than 13 weeks. So for this example, the employee was hired into a part-time position, moved to a full-time position in May, and then were offered benefits that were at or below the 9.66% of the mainland federal poverty level, and so they could use code 1A, and nothing else needs to be placed here at all. So this is an example of someone moving from part-time to full-time, and then having a 1A offer of coverage. And in this case, you do use a 2B code, B as in boy, because you're telling the IRS, I'm not open to a penalty for these months because this employee was a part-time employee. They were classified as a part-time employee. Then they moved to a full-time, so they're in a waiting period, that limited non-assessment, and then we offer them coverage. Some of you may not put a, them in a waiting period, and that's fine. So your offer of coverage would just change right away. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead oops, and check the chat box here. Um, so the question was, uh, are the 1094C and 1095C forms on the IRS website approved for filing purposes? And yes, that is the form that they expect to see. They don't want to see anything else. Um, and I'm not sure what the red NCR forms, but like some software, like the one I, I worked for in years prior, um, created a form that had all the pertinent information on it, had line 14, line 15, line 16, but it didn't look like the IRS 1095C. That form could go to the employees, no problem, cannot go to the IRS. So it needed to be a totally separate form that was produced and printed to be sent to the IRS. And that's the landscape version of the 1095C. <laughs> Excuse me. So if you just Google 1095 uh, 2016 1095C form, it'll pull up with the version that they're looking for. Um, so if a terminated employee, so if it's not due to a reduction in, if a COBRA offer is not due to a reduction in hours and it's a termination and you're fully insured, you don't need to report anything. It's only if you're self-insured. So if you're self-insured and a terminated employee stays on COBRA, you would still show a 1H no offer and a 2A not employed on your line 14 and line 16, but in part three, you're gonna show the months that they were covered under COBRA. So only if they enrolled do you need to show anything. Otherwise, no offer, nothing in, um, for the COBRA needs to show on, on the form. So Fernie at Owen Dunn has copies of the presentation and um, pretty sure this one's being recorded as well. So you can reach out to Fernie or Lisa at Owen Dunn and they will have that information for you. Are there any other questions or any examples you want to try and go through and I can pull up the form and start typing away. Anything you want to go over again? Oh, um, so the question was, do I have recommendations for software to prepare the form? So, Hi. <laughs> um, I, I have a bias towards one specific software because I helped build it, but um, most payroll systems, like the big ones, like the ADPs, the Paychecks, the Kronos, all of those have fairly good systems. Um, there are still issues with some of them when you take into account the 13-week rule, rule of parity, people going from full-time to part-time, part-time to full-time, so those are the employees you really need to watch. Um, if you have just a payroll system and you're looking for a form generator system, I have one. I've, I am a service bureau for a software company myself, so we can talk about that as well. Feel free to email me um, and we can talk about it. I've, I work in 
whatever system my clients have. So I've been in systems I never knew existed and working within their ACA program. So I can definitely help out uh, in any way you need there as well. So the difference between um, self-insured and fully insured. When you're self-insured, uh, you'd know if you are because you're paying your, all of your own claims. You have like a third-party administrator that the claims go from the doctor to the third-party administrator that then pays the claims out of your pocket um, based on some different plan options you might have. And it, you kind of get to design your own plan in a way. You don't have to cookie cutter off the shelf what Aetna has, what um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is, I think, still in California, has. Uh, you you kind of design your own, but you are playing, paying your own claims. There's different stop loss rules that you can put into place um, so that if you have a huge claim, let's say for a cancer or a baby born with a heart defect, those sorts of things. You, you can have some protection there where you won't be paying out you know, millions of dollars in claims because you're self-insured. Um, then there's different lasers. So if any of that sounds familiar to you, then you are self-insured and you do need to report on that. If you still have questions as to your status, you can always reach out to your um, broker at Owen Dunn and they can help you. Um, so for union employees, you are required to complete a form for union employees that are employed by you at any time, even if they are not with you for very long. So, um, and they have 130 or more hours of service in a month because that's considered a full-time employee. So I would make sure that you're creating a form for everybody if they were with you for at least one month and in that one month they hit 130 hours or more of service. And if we need to dive into a little bit more of that, um, please feel free to email me and we can talk about it as well. I'm, I'm here to help you, <laughs> okay? Um, not, not be a contribution to the swear jar. Uh, the things I bring up might con contribute to the swear jar, but I don't want to be the cause of that, okay? <laughs> um, any other questions? You're welcome. So that looks like about it. I thank everyone for attending. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I will obviously be getting busier and busier the closer we get to March 2nd, but I'll try and get back to you as, as soon as I possibly can. Okay, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.